Uh, so hi everyone and welcome to our fifth revolutionizing healthcare session. Uh, my name is Nick Maxfield. I'll be moderating today's session and I handle the Van der Schaal Labs communications. Uh, we'll also be joined by Professor Mihaila van der Schaal, who will be giving the presentation today and also answering your questions in the uh, Q&A session and open discussion. And co-moderating this session is Alex Chan, who's one of our lab's PhD students. So to give you an idea of what to expect from today's session, uh, as always, our purpose with revolutionizing healthcare is to build a shared community and develop a common language between machine learning experts and clinical professionals. And we aim to do this by defining and understanding medical problems through the use of formalisms and by mapping these formalisms to AI and machine learning solutions. So we're now partway through a sort of two part mini series we're doing on cancer. Um, in our previous session at the end of January, we looked at earlier parts of the cancer pathway, such as genetic risk, lifetime factors, presentation, diagnosis, and so forth. And this time around, we're going to look at subsequent parts of the cancer pathway, uh, mainly related to uh, patient treatment and follow-on care, etc. But we do plan to return to cancer in a bit more detail later, as it's obviously an expansive and complex topic that can't necessarily be covered in two sessions alone. So to give you an idea of the format of today's session, um, we'll start with my intro and then have some self-introductions from some of the cancer experts who were kind enough to talk to us ahead of this session. And then we'll go through some of the problems and questions that these cancer experts raised with us during our conversations with them. Um, the bulk of the session will really be a presentation by Mihaila in which she addresses these problems and questions um, through the use of formalisms, tying them to AI and machine learning solutions. And then we'll go into a Q&A and discussion on pretty much all of the above or about cancer treatment in general. Um, so if you do have any questions, and we strongly encourage you to ask questions, uh, please post them into the Zoom chat for everyone to see, um, hopefully during the presentation, because the earlier the better. And do let us know if your time is limited and you'll need to leave before we actually hit the Q&A session, in which case we will read your question out for you. Uh, we would like to restrict questions to practicing clinicians, if at all possible, because you are our target audience. And we aim to wrap up this session uh, shortly after 5 p.m. UK time. Right, uh, before I get started, though, I do need to make a short kind of declaration of interests. So if you are a UK-based clinician, uh, you can claim um, continuing professional development credits from the Royal College of Physicians for attending these sessions, and it's one credit per session. Um, but in order to do this, I need to make a quick disclaimer to the effect that uh, this is a non-commercial, no-fee event organized by the Van der Lab independently from our research sponsors, uh, that we have no conflicts of interest to declare, such as financial in, uh, relationships or so forth, that would undermine the balance, objectivity, or scientific rigor of these sessions. And we won't use these sessions to promote products or services. If we do mention one of our research sponsors, it will strictly be because it's relevant to the actual academic content of the session, and we will acknowledge the relationship whenever such a mention is made. Um, if you do want to know how to claim your CPD credits, uh, please wait till the end of the session, in which, uh, at which time I'll give you a kind of uh, a little explanation or guide about how to do that. So without further ado, um, first up, we have the self-introduction from the cancer experts who are kind enough to give their time to talk to us ahead of this session. Carlos Caldas, I'm a I'm a uh, uh, an oncologist and um, and a scientist, and uh, I'm a, I work in the hospital, but of course I'm a researcher and, and lead of a big research group at the Cancer Research UK Institute. I am Dr. Patricia Gans. I'm a medical oncologist uh, at UCLA, a professor, and uh, I am. Um, Associate Director for Population Science in the UCLA Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center. I'm also very interested in um, cancer care and quality of care and health care delivery in cancers. So I'm Fiona Gilbert. I'm a radiologist. I'm Professor of Radiology at the University of Cambridge. And um, I'm a specialist in breast imaging. That's one of my main um, areas of, of clinical expertise and also musculoskeletal imaging. Uh, but more recently, um, I've become particularly um, enthralled by um, uh, artificial intelligence and, and what it can do to help um, radiologists um, in, in, their, in their working lives. My name is Vincent Yanapragasam. I am an academic urologist with a specialism in prostate cancer. I work at the University of Cambridge and Cambridge University Hospitals Trust in the UK. 
And uh, I'm very interested in risk modeling and individualized management of patients uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer. Hi, I'm Kelly McCann. I'm a breast oncologist at UCLA. I have a, a PhD in cancer biology from Stanford. And I primarily specialize in breast cancer treatment, research, and prevention through a high-risk clinic. My name is Vasilis Tavrenidis. I am a clinician by training. At the moment, I'm doing a PhD at UCL under Professor Mark Emberton. Uh, the main theme is prostate cancer. Uh, and my main interest is basically the, the use of MRI to diagnose prostate cancer and also understand a little bit more about the biology of the disease using imaging. I'm Ani Purushotham. Uh, I'm the director of King's Health Partners Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, I'm a breast cancer surgeon and an academic with King's College London and Guy's and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust. Um, for three years, I spent half my life in India working for the Tata Trust um, cancer care program based in Mumbai, setting up cancer services across seven states in India um, and having developed the program uh, at the end of December, uh, left to come back to be full time in London. Carlos Scott. Okay, so next up we have a video in which the um, cancer experts that you've just seen raise some of the problems and questions related to patient care in the cancer domain, which will really um, frame a lot of the presentation and the content you'll see uh, in today's session. Prostate cancer in particular, certain prostate cancers actually are monitored over time rather than treated immediately because they're still at the early stage and are very unlikely to cause any problems. Um, the difficulty with that approach is that obviously different men are monitored at different intervals and we have as clinicians have to know when the disease progression is going to happen. So we have to know which part of the natural history of the disease a particular patient is going through at a particular moment in time, and then decide whether um, a, a particular cancer has to be treated right now or later on, deferred for later on, whether in, other, in, in a sense we have actually reached that um, window of curability, whether we have passed the point of no return whereby we have to treat immediately rather than let things evolve, um, let the disease run its course. You know, while we think about 1.8 million new cases of cancer every year, uh, you know, it's it's there's a subclassification challenge um, to and it's unlike cardiovascular disease, where really atherosclerosis is the only thing that you're worried about as a disease process. Yes, you know, genetic um, evolution of cancers is common, and you know that's a story that's generic, but it's a completely different in every organ site, depending on the exposures of the individual and their hereditary makeup. De novo, uh, you know, when we approach a patient, they have to have an evaluation that not only includes the anatomic distribution of the tumor. So, you know, if it's a tumor in the breast or a tumor in the lung or a tumor, tumor in the colon, we need to know, uh, you know, how extensive it is locally as well as whether it's traveled. So that's the anatomic, but then there are also histologic features that are still important uh, that give us some sense about the biology of the tumor. And for some tumors, that may all be all we need, but more and more, uh, you know, sequencing of tumors is being done uh, to really uh, refine and pr make pr precise. And there could be gene expression uh, diagnostic tools as well. There are many of them in breast cancer and, and in other cancers where it allows us to tailor the therapy so we don't treat somebody with something that wouldn't work. And uh, if something is likely to be very effective, we could use that. And it's very interesting that a mutation, um, something like BRAF, which is common both in melanoma and thyroid cancer and uh, colon cancer doesn't behave the same in each of those organs. So, you know, just because a targeted therapy works in one organ uh, for that mutation may not have the same relevance in another. There are many things that compete for, um, um, uh, for example, uh, a particular mortality outcome. So patients can die of all sorts of things. And sometimes weighing the risk of treatment, of cancer treatments, a lot of which can be 
um, quite deleterious, can have uh, harmful effects to the body, and ha have to be weighed against uh, the health status of a particular patient. And that is not, not a very easy clinical decision. Patients who get chemotherapy, patients who get uh, expensive uh, and complicated treatments like surgery or radiotherapy, sometimes can, um, um, can have very, uh, their, their clinical outcomes are, are not very um, well known and it's not very clear whether they would benefit from a particular treatment. And quantifying that risk, quantifying those competing risks and um, um, versus various other treatments is very important. Um, so that's definitely another application that I could see in cancer. Uh, once the diagnosis has been established or during the establishment of the diagnosis uh, and then the planning of the, the treatment, what type of treatment do you advise this patient for that particular type of tumor that they have and for their particular um, physical and um, mental health state? Uh, and what will they tolerate? What will they tolerate? What will work and what won't work? I think there you have a huge opportunity and you know, many, many people are already looking at this uh, in terms of um, selecting patients for the right treatment at the right time to get the right outcomes. And I think that is, that is an incredibly uh, important thing that we need to make sure uh, our patients actually um, um, get uh, in terms of their care. Uh, and you devise algorithms based on previous patients' uh, data uh, in terms of what is likely to work in a patient and what is not likely to work. At the moment, uh, we sit as a very talented group of clinicians uh, in multidisciplinary teams. You have about 30 people in the room together. Now it's on Zoom, but in the room together, these are highly trained professionals. Sometimes it's difficult for the clinicians to pull out all this data and therefore machine learning has a huge part to play there in terms of adding value to the clinician's decision. So it does the bulk of the heavy lifting and, and then you have the clinician where, that comes in where the, 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 the recommendations are a bit more nuanced. I think that's where the clinician, an experienced clinician or group of clinicians uh, will play a real role. In predicting therapy response. So in patients that are ongoing active treatment, that could be active treatment in the setting of, in the curative setting where the tumor is still in situ. And so you can actually image the tumor and do serial biopsies in the tumor while the tumor is being treated. Um, for example, neoadjuvant therapy in breast cancer or in uh, rectal cancer or in head and neck cancer. And then in people that you more in with advanced disease, but again, the same thing, people with metastatic disease and you're treating them and you want to know if they are responding or not and predicting response instead of waiting weeks to months to see if the treatment has worked. So can you, after one course of treatment, predict how the patient is going to respond to subsequent courses of treatment? without having to do imaging because imaging usually it's done after two or three cycles of treatment and it's a very crude measurement. When we, we, we see a publication, they're, uh, they're presenting the maximum grade of toxicity, but many of these treatments have continuous low level toxicities, which are not reported. And so when you then start to give the drug recipe that was published in the journal, you, you get into a lot of trouble with patients. So, you know, there's a big steep learning curve in this translation of the published literature on um, the effective or eff eff efficacy data, then translating it to giving patients. And I, I remember I used to, to kind of have anxiety every July when I'd have a new group of fellows who would be training and learning how to give some of these drugs, and if it was a new drug that I'd never given before, you know, you're 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 just anxiously, you know, concerned about, you know, you want to give an effective dose. That's the published dose. That's what's approved. But you may wind up with a lot of toxicity when you're giving it to patients. So, I think those are some areas where predicting predicting who is likely to do okay, if you will, with the approved dose, and who may get into trouble. You know, looking at data. Uh, from real world data might be helpful. You know, our drugs are very expensive. You know, this is the issue. And, um, they, you know, even I think in the UK, you know, even when they do get approved and whatever your negotiated 
uh, payments are, they're still expensive. So you'd like to have a pretty good handle of, you know, who's likely to respond, what kind of toxicities they're going to have um, a priori when you're approaching that next patient. And to the extent cumulative data from trials can give you that information um, to at least be suspicious and or in the early rollout of the drugs, you know, say within a year of uh, approval, uh, what kind of signals you can get would be very important. In people that have been treated with curative intent, so a woman with breast cancer has a breast cancer that is two centimeters in size or even one centimeter in size, no lymph nodes involved, has surgery, and then the question is, is she cured or is she not cured? And so predicting long-term outcome and predicting relapse. Post-treatment, the follow-up of uh, treatment, uh, follow-up care of patients. I think we, uh, as clinicians, we over-investigate patients. Um, they, at the slightest um, concern, they undergo Im imaging, uh, which at the end of the day may not necessarily be necessary. We get them to have routine CT scans every six months, every year, mammograms every year. There's actually no hard evidence that this is actually required. And I think it's time to get that evidence. And the reason why I say that is twofold. One is it's not good for the patient. Patients get very anxious when they come up for their routine mammogram, when they come up for their repeat CT scan. I mean, we have, we've all been patients. It just gets, it becomes a little bit anxiety provoking to go to a hospital, to see a consultant again, to get examined again, and then to get more investigations because you relive all the time the previous experience that you've had, uh, which is a negative experience because you've been diagnosed with cancer at the end of that experience. So I think a sensible way forward to see how machine learning can utilize the evidence we have will help build the evidence to see when investigations are really going to be useful and what investigations are going to be useful uh, for the patient. And the second big reason for doing this is the cost. These are costly investigations, and I think we waste a lot of money doing things that are unnecessary, that are of little benefit to the patients, and I think we, we have the opportunity to explore that. Okay, so next up we have Mihaila's presentation in which she will take a lot of these uh, problems and, and issues that have just been addressed by the experts in the video you've seen and match them to AI and machine learning solutions through the use of formalisms. And just a reminder as well, um, please do ask some questions. Uh, that's one of the reasons we created these sessions. Um, so please put them in the Zoom chat if you have any questions at all. And um, the earlier, the better, so that we can get around to them and sort them in the time that we have available. Hello, and welcome to our second revolutionizing healthcare session dedicated to cancer care. In our previous revolutionizing healthcare, we have introduced the cancer pathway and we have discussed what machine learning can do to empower clinicians and patients. In particular, we have focused on the first part of the cancer pathway, and we have discussed how machine learning can help estimate genetic risk of a patient from developing cancer, as well as lifestyle, lifestyle presentation and diagnosis, including early diagnosis using machine learning. Today, we are going to focus on the second part of the cancer pathway, starting with treatments. And we are going to discuss what machine learning can do to enable clinicians determine what is the best treatment for the patient at hand, what type of interventions they should do on this particular patient and when. But before we do so, I would like to introduce a demonstrator of a clinical decision support system for cancer care that we have developed two years ago together with Public Health England. This demonstrator uses a large number of our machine learning methods, and it can show the potential that machine learning can have in assisting clinicians and patients. Um, this presentation that I'm going to give today is only very short. However, if you want to hear more about the demonstrator that we have built, 
the data that we have used and the technology that we have incorporated in this demonstrator, I invite you to take a look at the Turing talk, which I gave two years ago, together with our collaborator, Dr. Jem Rashbas, who is the UK's um, national director for cancer disease registration. You can see this Turing talk at the YouTube link indicated below. Please take a look if you are interested to hear a lot more details than what I'm going to describe today. This demonstrator was built to assist clinicians and patients for a large number of cancers. Today, I'm going to just highlight one particular cancer, breast cancer. Let us assume that we have a patient that was just diagnosed with cancer. And we have here a lot of information, a lot of variables which are collected about the patient at diagnosis time, including the age of diagnosis, whether the patient was detected by screening or not, tumor size, tumor grade, et cetera, et cetera. And what we want to estimate now for this particular patient, given their unique characteristics, what is the probability of this patient to die from cancer? For this, we have used a machine learning method called autoprognosis. I have introduced autoprognosis in a previous revolutionizing healthcare session. If you are interested in the method, please take a look. Autoprognosis is an automated machine learning framework for generating clinical risk scores at scale. And uh, what you see here is that we have trained autoprognosis on the basis of UK's cancer registry, and we are able to issue forecasts of mortality for this particular patient with this unique characteristic. You see here the estimated probability of the patient to die from cancer over the next three years. However, we are not only able to issue predictions. We would also like to understand the predictions that are issued by autoprognosis. So we want to have machine learning interpretability. For that, we have used another machine learning method introduced by our lab called Invase. Invase is able to look at a particular black box model, such as autoprognosis, and reveal what features were important for this particular prediction for this patient at hand. What has autoprognosis looked at when issuing this particular prediction? You can see here what features autoprognosis has considered, what is the weight of these particular features, and how the importance of these features has changed over time for this particular patient. I'm going to talk more about Invase in a future revolutionizing healthcare session. Let us now consider the patient progression over time. A lot of information is collected about the patient over time, including treatments, a variety of um, possibly interventions, lab tests, et cetera, et cetera. And on the basis of this type of uh, information that we have from the UK Cancer Registry, we are issuing dynamic forecasts for this particular patient. So unlike in autoprognosis, where we are only looking at the data diagnosis time to determine mortality risk over time, in this case, we integrate a wealth of information that is acquired about the patient over time to update the risk of the patient from dying from cancer. So we issue dynamic forecasts. We identify and predict in a personalized way the disease trajectory for this particular patient. For that, we have used another machine learning model that I have introduced um, in revolutionizing healthcare free, the attentive state space model. This machine learning model can be used and trained on the time series data to issue mortality risk from cancer over time. In addition to issuing predictions for mortality for the main cancer, we can also look at competing risks. What is the probability of the patient to develop another related cancer? What is the probability of a patient to die from another disease, such as cardiovascular disease? Or what is the probability of a patient to have recurrence? 
we are using for that the wealth of information that we have available. And we are able to identify what information has led to a particular prediction. Why a particular, for instance, um, risk of the patient dying from cancer has changed at a particular moment in time. What is the information that has led to this change in prediction? For that, we use a technology that I briefly highlighted before in revolutionizing healthcare called deep sensing. This enables us to understand what information we should collect in order to issue better predictions over time, as well as look in the past and understand what features were more important at what moment in time for a particular prediction. Let us now go one step further, not only issue predictions and predictions of mortality and recurrence, but also understand what treatments are more effective for this particular patient given their unique characteristic. What you see here is uh, different ways to estimate the treatment effects for a particular patient. We are going to do causal inference or better said causal effect inference for estimating treatment effects. What you see in the left side of this panel is um, the population level assessment of risk for various types of interventions. In blue, no treatment, in orange, radiotherapy, in green, chemotherapy, and in red, chemotherapy plus radiotherapy. And what you can see here is the population risk for one year mortality given the different interventions. And you see that chemotherapy plus radiotherapy is the best um, treatment option for the average patient. And what you can also see here is the propensity score associated with the different types of treatments in the average population. What we are going to do next using machine learning is to estimate not an average treatment effect, but rather an individualized personalized treatment effect, such that in this way, using machine learning, we can estimate what treatment option is best for this particular patient, given their unique characteristic. You can see here that for this patient, it is chemotherapy rather than chemotherapy and radiotherapy, which leads, which leads to the lowest risk from dying from cancer. Hence, it is chemotherapy rather than chemotherapy and radiotherapy, which is good for the average population, that it is best for this patient at hand. I'm going to describe today how we can do that using machine learning, how we can move from an average estimation of treatment effects into a personalized, individualized treatment effect estimation using machine learning. Finally, we may be interested to understand the progression of cancer in different types of patients and do deep phenotyping, longitudinal phenotyping. For instance, we have used here a different machine learning technology called deep predictive clustering, which is able to estimate how the patient is going to evolve over time and do temporal phenotyping. We are able in this way to identify similar patients like the current patient at hand, and not only issue predictions over time and phenotyping over time, but also find the closest patients in that particular phenotype to the current patient. And in this way, clinicians and patients can use this tool to understand progression and progression over time. And this forms an important tool to empower clinicians to understand progression for their patient and also an important tool for patients because they can use it to understand what patients like them are going to experience uh, in the short run and in the long run, inclusively the effect of treatment. As I mentioned um, before, today I'm going to only focus on one particular part of this demonstrator that we have built a few years back. I'm going to focus on the role of machine learning to estimate personalized treatment effects. In order to do so, we are moving from randomized controlled trials, which are focused on estimating population level effects, average treatment effects, into a personalized setting where we are estimating using machine learning individualized treatment effects. 
While randomized controlled trials are and will remain the golden standard for estimating average treatment effects, they suffer from various limitations. They include non-representative patients, patients that are elderly or patients that may have comorbidities are often not enrolled in randomized controlled trials. Yet they represent the representative patients, the patients that most often suffer from cancer. Also randomized controlled trials are focused on a very specific question and are often unable to capture the complexity of healthcare. So patients that may suffer from a variety of underlying diseases and may have other medication may not be necessarily um, included in these trials and it will be very difficult to estimate the effect of a variety of other observations on this particular patient, including the effects on the particular medication on this patient. Also randomized controlled trials often include uh, a limited number of patients. They are time consuming and involve an enormous cost. Unlike this, Machine learning can complement randomized clinical trials to do personalized therapeutics, thereby enabling estimating on individualized treatment effects for the patient at hand from real world observational data. In this way, we are able to capture the complexity of healthcare and we are going to be able to estimate the effect of treatments for patients that are representative and similar to the current patient at hand including elderly patients and patients that may have multiple morbidities and comorbidities. This enables also using machine learning to have a scalable and adaptive implementation, taking into consideration the variety of treatments and observation we have at our disposal over time. It enables fast deployment and cost-effective deployment since all we need is observational data in the form of electronic health records and use of advanced machine learning technology. So what is our goal? Our goal is to learn individualized treatment effects, causal effect inference from observational data. It is well known that um, the average treatment as determined by a randomized controlled trial is often not representative for a particular patient because treatment effects are often heterogeneous. And even though a particular treatment may show efficacy on the average population, it may be more or less efficient on the patient at hand. Hence, it is our objective to use machine learning to estimate individualized treatment effects of an intervention or treatment from observational data. I'm talking here about causal effect inference as introduced by Neyman and Rubin, and not about causal relation discovery as introduced by Judea Pearl. Our goal is hence to use machine learning to estimate the causal effect treatment of an individual from observational data, such as electronic health records. Then for the patient's hand, given their genetic information, biological information, clinical information, demographic and social features, we are going to be able to estimate using machine learning algorithms the benefit for a particular treatment for this particular patient, the patient at hand. For that, we are moving in the realm of personalized therapeutics. And as I mentioned before, machine learning can do a lot in this area. Over the last five years, we have developed in our lab a large number of machine learning methods to be able to estimate personalized therapeutics from observational data. Today, I'm going to give only a brief description of what is possible. For instance, for a patient with breast cancer, having these unique characteristics, we are going to be able to estimate which therapy or treatment is best for this particular patient. We are going to be able to estimate, for instance, what is the effect of chemotherapy on survival, five-year survival, for instance, for this particular patient. We may also be able to estimate and determine optimal dosage for the patient at hand. 
If you want to learn more about the different machine learning methods for individualized treatment effect estimation, I invite you to take a look at our website. Since today, I'm going to only talk briefly about this particular topic. However, on our website at this particular link, we have a wealth of information and a description of different types of methods and what type of um, questions they can answer. Also, if you want to uh, read a good tutorial about this topic on how real world patient data can be used to estimate individualized treatment effects using machine learning, I invite you to take a look at a recent paper we have published a few months back. Please take a look. So what are we trying to do here? We are trying to estimate the effect of a treatment on an individual from observational data. And in order to do so, we try to answer what if questions. We are trying to estimate counterfactuals. We are using observational data, training data, and in the training data, the patients are either treated or untreated. So should you see here, for instance, uh, the red patient, patient with features X1, and you see that this particular patient was treated with, for instance, radiotherapy. And this represents um, a treated patient, hence the treatment W is equal to one. We can then observe what is the effect of this particular treatment decision on this patient with features X1. The outcome is captured in the output variable outcome variable Y1. Here I'm going to focus on only a binary treatments, treated and untreated, but this can be generalized to multiple treatments, as I showed to you in the demonstrator. However, for simplicity today, I'm going to only focus on these binary treatments, treated or untreated. And the challenge is, how can we estimate the true causal effects for this particular patient one, given the fact that we only observe factual outcomes. What has happened to the patient if he was treated? We do not observe the counterfactual. What would have happened to the patient if the patient was not treated? In this case, we observe Y1 given the treatment one, but we do not observe the outcome Y1 given the fact that the patient, what would have happened if the patient was not treated? Zero. So we do not observe Y1, zero. What you can see here is that in order to estimate for patient one, the causal effect inference, the estimation of the effect of treated or not treating or not treating this particular patient, we are moving from a supervised machine learning problem where we are just predicting dead or not dead or mortality into a complex problem of causal effect inference and estimation of counterfactuals where we do not have explicit labels. We only observe the factuals, but we do not observe the counterfactuals. Yet, we want to answer what would have happened to the patient if we would have treated them in a different way, either with a different treatment or at a different moment in time. We are able to cast and formalize this problem using the powerful framework introduced by Neyman almost 100 years ago. This is the potential outcome framework. We have observational data, which is the patient features XI, and we have a treatment assignment WI. Here, we are discussing only binary treatments. Either the patient is treated, and hence WI is equal to one, or untreated. WI is equal to zero. Given the, poten given the treatment, we are observing the potential outcomes. The outcome from treating the patient and the outcome from not treating the patient. But note that in the data, we do not have the counterfactuals. So if the patient was treated, we only observe that. And if the patient, patient was not treated, we only observe that. We do not observe the counterfactual. This is why we call them potential outcomes. And even though we have only factual outcomes, we are aiming to estimate the causal effects as shown at the bottom of this uh, slide. We are trying to estimate the causal effect T 
given the unique characteristics of the patient X. So you want to estimate the effect of treatment for this particular patient with feature X. Note hence that we are moving here from predictive modeling, supervised learning into causal modeling. And for that, we need to solve a variety of challenges. We need to deal with counterfactual estimation, but we also need to learn how to best model interventions. Shall we use this um, treatment decisions, WI, as a feature, or shall we model them otherwise? And also, we need to deal with selection bias or covariate shift. Patients are treated by doctors on the basis of their knowledge. This is not a randomized controlled trial. We are learning here on the basis of biased observational data. So we need to learn to estimate treatment effects given the selection bias. And in this way, the training distribution is going to be different than the testing distribution. So we need to be careful how we estimate causal effect inference for a particular patient on the basis of that bias data set. For that, we are going to make two assumptions. The fact that we are going to have ignorability, in other words, we have no unmeasured confounders. So our observational data set does not contain hidden confounders. And secondly, we have common support. For all the patients in the data set, we do not have patients that are either always treated or always untreated. So we are able to estimate correctly the effect of the treatments on the basis of observational data. This represents, of course, quite strong assumptions. And currently, machine learning um, researchers are working hard to relax these two assumptions. But today, I'm going to make these two assumptions for the subsequent part of my talk. And we are going to try to estimate causal effect inference. We are going to try to estimate the response surfaces for the patient given their feature X. So we are going to estimate the treatment effect as shown in here on the basis of observational data. And as I mentioned before, this is hard because as shown in the lower part of the panel, we have uh, information about the patient only in terms of the factual outcomes, not the counterfactual outcomes. You see here, for instance, the red dots are patients that were treated and the blue dots are patients that were not treated. Yet we need to learn on the basis of such treated and untreated patients for a new patient with feature X, what will be the effect of treating this particular patient? So how can we synthesize counterfactuals thereby estimating the effect of a treatment on a patient? We are going to use for that generative adversarial networks or for short GANs. Most probably you are already familiar with GANs because they represent state-of-the-art technology in unsupervised learning and they are able to generate um, new data with the same statistics as that of the training set. You have probably heard about GANs success in generating new images, for instance. But here we are going to use GANs in a different way. Let me briefly remind you what GANs are. In a GAN framework, the generator is trying to generate fake samples, thereby fooling the discriminator, who is trying to estimate whether the sample it receives are coming from the real samples or from the fake samples generated by the generator. In GANs, the generator and the discriminator are involved in a zero-sum game. And in this way, the discriminator is training the generator in an adversarial way to generate better and better samples that are resembling the real samples. So how can we synthesize counterfactuals using GANs? Can we use a standard GAN framework to generate the missing data, the counterfactual data? The answer is no. The reason we cannot use a standard GAN to do so is because the discriminator doesn't have its availability for a particular data, the factual and the counterfactual. 
it only has factors. Yet it needs to train the generator to generate all types of um, samples, both for uh, treated patients as well as untreated patients. So the discriminator uh, would need to have access to the counterfactuals to be able to train the generator. And this is not available in the data. So what can we do? For that, we have built a new GAN framework that we call GANite. This GANite framework has two components. The first component is a counterfactual block, which is a modified conditional GAN that is generating counterfactuals conditions on the real outcome, only based on the factual. So the discriminator of this counterfactual block, DG, is having access only on the factual for the patient X. Only YF, F standing for factual, is available. Y counterfactual, so the treatment effects for counterfactuals for the patient X are not available. On the basis of the factual um, loss, we are going to determine a supervised loss that is going to be used by the counterfactual generator G to estimate um, the effect of treatments. Then this information is provided to a second generative adversarial network, the IT block. IT stands for individualized treatment effects. In order to generate full outcome distribution, conditional only on the features of the patient. So in the second GAN, in the IT block, the generator is only given the features of the patient and the possible set of treatments, and it is able to generate the different outcomes for the patient. It is doing so by getting information from the counterfactual block, which was trained on the basis of the factual data. If you want to read more about this, I invite you to take a look at our website. But the intuition behind it is that if the generated counterfactuals follow the underlying distribution, it should not be possible to discriminate the real outcome from the generated outcome. In, the, in other words, we are able to estimate the effect of a variety of treatments effectively given the unique characteristics of the patient X. Also, we are able to estimate treatment effects over time. So while GANITE is used on the basis of static data and estimating whether a patient should receive uh, radiotherapy or chemotherapy, for instance, or what dosage it should be using, in this other framework that we have developed, we are also able to estimate on the basis of electronic health tracker data the effect of uh, treatment over time. We are able to determine in this way how to treat a patient, when to treat a patient, and when to stop a treatment. And we are doing that based on the unique characteristics of the patient that include both static data, but also time series data, patient history. In this way, we have developed a new machine learning framework that we call Counterfactual Recurrent Network, or for short, CRM. CRN is able to build treatment invariant representation using domain adversarial training or domain adaptation. In this way, we are able to deal with the bias in the available data set. And counterfactual recurrent neural networks are more effective than marginal structural models, which depend on propensity scoring, inverse propensity scoring to deal with the balancing of the representations on the basis of the available bias data. Then CRNs are estimating counterfactual trajectories for different types of treatments using a sequence-to-sequence -sequence architecture. So methods that have been used in machine learning for translation, for instance, translating from English to French, are used here to translate from the current trajectory of the patient into a future trajectory that does depend on the treatment that is given to the patient at a particular moment in time. This uh, framework, CRN, 
has been um, incorporated into a unified end-to-end -end pipeline for clinical decision support, which can be used for cancer, but also for many other diseases. We call this framework clairvoyance. And I have briefly talked about clairvoyance when I have discussed um, machine learning for ICU support. If you want to read more about the various projects where we have used machine learning to support clinicians and patients with cancer, please take a look at our website dedicated and providing a spotlight on cancer research using machine learning. Thank you. Okay, so it's now time for our Q&A session, and I think most of you already know the rules, but um, please do post your questions into the Zoom chat. I think we already have a few lined up, which is fantastic. Um, we would like to restrict our questions to practicing clinicians, if at all possible, since you are our target audience. Um, so what's gonna happen is when we choose your question, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself, at which point, please just uh, identify yourself. And um, it would be great if we could keep your questions to about one minute per question so that we can allow three minutes in total for each question and answer. And then um, once you've got your answer and hopefully are happy with your answer, please remute yourself afterwards so we don't continue to hear you um, as we proceed with the session. Okay, so I think our first question is from David Cox. Um, so please uh, go ahead, David. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Mahila. Um, Really fascinating presentation, particularly as a clinician, seeing how, how in-depth you can be. Um, my question as a uh, consultant neonatologist and TOEFL fellow is that um, when I look to see how we can use these ML techniques for our, to support our clinical decisions, the different algorithms and the types of algorithm have different outputs. And what do we know about how easy they are for clinicians to interpret those outputs? And therefore, is it important when you're designing what type of algorithm you're going to use to think about the clinician, think about the data that they may be able to process and think about how the choice of the algorithm and the technique will enable them to understand what's being outputted? So thank you, David. This is a very important and at the same time complex question. I think that probably my first answer to it will be uh, we should have an entire session dedicated to discussing what are possibly good ways to interpret machine learning models and what is truly actionable for clinicians and what is really evidence for clinicians to adopt a particular suggestion of an algorithm. But in a nutshell, I would say um, this is clearly an important topic when a machine learning models is issuing predictions, for instance, forecasts of a patient, for instance, having recurrence, the probability of recurrence in a particular amount of time. But it's even more challenging if we talk about treatment and treatment effects, because then is a real recommendation that's provided by a machine learning algorithm to a clinician. So it's becoming even more important that the clinician is debugging and validating this particular suggestion of the algorithm. So um, I think that this is again a long discussion and I propose we take it to another session because one may want to see what are good uh, features that have been used by the model to issue this particular prediction? What would happen if a, a feature of a patient would be different? Would the recommendation change? How confident the algorithm is in a particular prediction? Um, how do similar patients um, uh, do if this prediction in this, this, this particular recommendation is followed? And what are similar patients uh, for which the algorithm would propose similar uh, interventions? But again, maybe we should take this in a separate session since it's such an important topic. Thank you. Okay, so I think our next question is from Henk. And it was uh, already a little bit sussed out in the um, comment section, but Henk, if you wouldn't mind just uh, answering the final version, uh, asking the final version of your question, that would be great. So I think um, Henk may be stuck on mute. Um, I'm sorry, that was the classical mistake. 
<laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was a bit triggered by the, the remarks about uh, the follow-up schemes, uh, which are used for patients who are treated for cancer, um, uh, because they would in, in, induce anxiety and things like that. I agree with that, by the way. Um, and but my question was a bit uh, like, like um, well, there, we don't have a single clue, to be honest, whether or not our all our work we do with those patients works or not. We, we don't know whether those patients are better off. Who are detected a little bit earlier and we don't know and we we detect half of the recurrences not by our schemes but uh, by interval uh, cancers so I was, I was a little bit surprised in, a, in a, for a way in which uh, artificial intelligence would be able to contribute to this question because i think what we need to do as clinicians to keep those patients uh, to do to uh, to gather some data about those patients to start with because I, I don't, I think that Michaela will need some data to start her artificial intelligence program with. That was a little bit of a remark and a little bit of a question, both. Because the question, of course, was Michaela, do you think that you you are in a in a in a position that you can contribute to this question? Because it really is an important question. So one, thank you, Hank, for this. So what I wanted to bring to the community. Uh, of clinicians in this particular session is to introduce this concept that we can go beyond just predictions, whether it's prediction at what one time point for um, of survival or recurrence, or whether we make predictions on, on the basis of time series data. The new concept I wanted to introduce today was to talk about the ability to do counterfactual estimation and try to look at various alternatives both various alternatives of treatments and treatments over time. In other words, when should I intervene? And what will happen if I intervene with using this treatment or that treatment or do nothing? And also questions such as, would it have been better if I would have intervened earlier? And what would have been the impact of this earlier intervention? Of course, Hank, you are right, unless we have data that shows indeed that different patients at different stages of their disease have been intervened on and have been intervened on in different ways, that type of data needs to be available. That's the reason mm -hmm. I said this work is only valuable if we have indeed uh, no hidden confounders and we have sufficient overlap, meaning there is indeed data that shows us possible different types of interventions at different moments in time for different classes of patients. But assuming that the data is available, which is of course maybe in some cases a stretch, but if data is available, what I think these tools can do can show what treatment may be better and what would be the effect of treating earlier or later by, do, by answering such what if questions. Mm -hmm. What if I would have treated in this way or that way? What would have happened if I was treated a few months earlier or a few months later? So, what I wanted to bring again to the community is this idea of individualized treatment effects or causal effect inference to answer this type of what if questions, not only, not only predictions, but rather this time, what if questions. Yeah, thank you, uh, Michaela. I understand this, but I, I, I really think that there is a task for clinicians over here to gather, the, to gather those data. Because the, the strange thing is that we all uh, follow up all our patients, but we don't know why we do what we do. And I, I think I'm, I'm a general practitioner, so I, I don't follow up with those patients. But uh, I, I see around and I, I've, I've been looking for uh, for programs with uh, with evidence beneath it, but I couldn't find those. So there's so still a, a last job to do. <laughs> So maybe, Hank, given the fact that this is important because machine learning cannot help empower you without data, maybe no. what I would propose is to maybe have a roundtable and a discussion for clinicians at different stages of care, from prevention in your case to maybe treatment in the case of, of somebody like Kelly, uh, of Professor Gan of, of Patricia, uh, and see what would happen if indeed the data would be collected in the ideal case and what can we do in that case? I think it's a nice idea, Michaela, because there's a lot, a lot, a lot of work to do. I think. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Um, so next, uh, I think we have a question from uh, 
Timing. Um, so please go ahead and unmute uh, yourself. Hi. Thank so you. So thanks for the really nice, inspiring talk. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, could you comment a bit on, uh, right now we have these very good predictor models. How like, uh, what are the steps we need to take to bring these models to hospitals and to allow continuous integration so that patient, like new patients and new data can become, can improve the model accuracy as we treat more patients. And this is a medical student from Cambridge. Yeah. Thank you. So not a practicing clinician yet, but a clinician in the, in the making. Thanks. So, so, so thank you. So thank you, uh, Timing, for, for this. So this is a very interesting question I have not touched upon in any of the sessions so far. So how can we use data to keep improving our models over time as more evidence becomes available or as Hank suggested as more data becomes available, maybe from different hospitals or from different countries or from different classes of patients. So um, an important paradigm in machine learning that can address that is lifelong learning or continual learning. It's a topic I've not discussed so far, but maybe I should in a subsequent session. And in these new paradigms, the machine learning model is going to learn over time that it is time to adapt itself because of the shift in the data or because additional data has been added that may influence the predictions that have been learned on the basis of predictive models that have been trained based on older data. So I think machine learning has already some solutions in that regard. Uh, and this represents somewhat frontiers, again, on machine learning. But I think that one basic way in which you can do it right now, I think right now many people are training and retraining their model every so often, being aware of the fact that clinical practice has changed or because more data is acquired. But ideally, what you would like to do is to have a much more systematic process where the machine learning itself learns that the predictions that were learned on the basis of older data become outdated. The confidence in these predictions has become lower and hence is an opportunity and there is time to retrain the model. That being said, some of the methods such as autoprognosis, the machine learning model I described in an earlier session are very good for this because at the push of a button, they can retrain themselves. So, Automated machine learning represents also a way to solve it. And continual learning and lifelong learning are other solutions to address that. But maybe again, subject of a subsequent session to, to just discuss this indeed. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think we had a question next from uh, Kelly. I just wanted to check whether it's a, uh, we should handle it as a question or a comment because it kind of, went into um, both territories a little bit. Um, so, but uh, Kelly, uh, yeah, there you go, hi. <laughs> so I was just commenting about the input data. So tumors, especially in breast cancer, they're very heterogeneous and our data doesn't take that into consideration really. It pretends that there are three types of breast cancers and in trying to predict whether or not somebody's gonna respond, we have to take into account a lot of the biomarkers, maybe some gene expression analysis, things that aren't really traditionally included in these prediction models. So, so, so thank you, Kelly. So I think there are two parts to that. One is the clinical trial, one is the observational data from an electronic health record, and maybe not the electronic health record of today, maybe the electronic health record of tomorrow, which may contain even more information. But I think that as long as this rich information is available to the clinician and it is indeed recorded in the electronic health record, then I think one can learn on the basis of such observational data, being aware of the bias associated with it and hence needing to adjust for it, may be able to learn a much more refined um, prediction of what treatment would be good for what patient and when. So this is kind of exactly what I'm trying to, to bring to the community to try to say, well, there are some new classes of methods that may allow you to learn in a much more accurate 
and refined way than clinical trials may. Because in clinical trials, you may not have enough patients, the patients may not be sufficiently many, and also the information may be um, limited about them. Maybe more information is available over time, and that information can and should inform the treatment that should be given. But this information hopefully is available to you, the clinicians, and is available in observational data, and it can be used to identify and learn treatment effects for individualized patients. Eventually, hopefully. Right now, the, the clinical record doesn't even take into account, or there's not even a space to put in that kind of data. So the, the medical record itself would have to adopt some kind of ontology, I think, in order to be most helpful. So I guess, thank you, Kelly. I guess another session we should have on what electronic health records of the future should include as information <laughs> to allow machine learning to learn uh, more effectively. And I know that this is a topic of interest to many. So I guess we should, yeah. we should try to take it. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think next up we have a question from Brent. Um, so please go ahead. Hi, Mahala, great talk. My question has to do about the assumption of no unmeasured confounding. And I know that's a, a very difficult topic. And it just seems like, you know, these are included as an assumption at the beginning of all these models. And I'm just trying to think, how can we what are some other tools or, or clever ways that can be used so that this can be a little more convincing? Because anytime I'm, I'm trying to evaluate whether something is causally, um, ca a causal effect, I'm always concerned that there's some other variables that are unmeasured. Thank you, Brent. So this represents, again, the, a frontier, an important question and a frontier in machine learning as we speak. Two recent, um, two, two recent uh, works from our lab uh, that have tried to address this question and move the frontier a little bit further, not a lot further, but a little bit further. In one of them, we look at uh, time series data and we use time series as a way to deconfound the data. So that's one particular um, idea. Another one is to look at multiple environments so multiple hospitals or multiple countries that may have potentially different types of confounders and where maybe we can balance um, the effect of these different hidden confounders. So a little bit of progress in recent times, hopefully more in the future as the entire machine learning community is putting their minds together to, to try to address this problem further. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, so it's just about ten past, and I think that's that's probably all the time we have. Uh, we do have a couple of remaining questions, but um, I think from non clinicians. Um, so if if you want to sort of address those to me by email or something, I can pass them on to Mihail, or you can send them um, directly through, and yeah, we can tackle those uh, at. A uh, later point. Um, but before I go, uh, please let me just give you a quick overview of, of our next session, which will be on the 31st of March at 4 p.m. UK time. Uh, we haven't actually announced the topic yet, but you'll get that hopefully by email within the next few days. So please stay tuned for that. Um, the format will, however, be relatively similar to this time and all our recent sessions in that we'll start with um, clinicians, problems and questions, and tie these to AI and machine learning solutions via formalisms. And we will have open Q&A and discussion session. Um, now, if you want to uh, claim CPD credits for attendance, please just drop me an email at the uh, email address you'll see on the slide right here. Uh, please just let me know which sessions you attended and also how you attended these sessions. So for example, whether you joined live or whether you've watched our um, archived YouTube videos. Uh, so you can claim credits for any archived session on YouTube um, starting from December 16th last year. And when you've emailed me, basically, I'll send you back a certificate that allows you to apply via the Royal College of Physicians CPD site. Um, and this certificate will include session codes that you can use when filling this out on that website. Um, 
Also, I'd like to just quickly direct your attention to a recent piece of content that we created um, focusing on our uh, cancer-related research projects. This is something that Mihaila also mentioned at the end of her presentation. Um, the URL is here on the slide, so please give that a quick look if you can. Um, other than that, if you do have any friends or colleagues that you think would be interested in uh, these sessions, uh, please send them the URL that you see at the bottom of the slide here. Again, you know, we do want to build a community, um, an interdisciplinary community. So a word of mouth is very important in ensuring that these sessions do grow and that we get the right mix of ideas and input into them. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank you for all of your questions and thoughts and opinions and discussion. Um, and thank you especially as well to the cancer experts who uh, gave so much of their time to talk to us ahead of this session and shared their guidance and insight. Very much appreciated. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again in March. In the meantime, please take care and stay safe.